Hello, dear friends, I hope you're doing well. Is it a prerequisite to be a statistician or to come from a scientific branch to be able to conduct a quantitative study? In case we are not statisticians, is it a good idea to ask someone to run the relevant statistical measures for us and provide us with ready-made results so that we can exploit them? A division of labor, in other words, what are the different types of quantitative research designs? We will try to shed some light on these questions. But before that, let me go back to the previous video on qualitative designs and provide this reminder of what a research design is. A research design is a set of strategies and plans. It's a roadmap, as it were, that guides the research process in its entirety, starting from the formulation of our objectives, research questions, research hypotheses, data collection, data analysis, data interpretation, etc. There are two types of designs, the qualitative and the quantitative. And with respect to the qualitative, we talked about it. It's, it's the one that uses non-numerical data, while quantitative designs are based mainly on numerical statistical evidence. And the question that arises is whether we can conduct a quantitative study while we are not experts in the field of statistics or when we do not come from branches that are scientific. The answer is that we can still conduct a quantitative study without necessarily coming from a scientific branch and without having a diploma in the field of statistics or in mathematics. However, this necessitates an adequate amount of effort with the aim of understanding the fundamental concepts. There are very good textbooks that introduce statistics in applied linguistics or other fields. There are tutorials, there are websites, there are YouTube, you know, videos that can help you do this. All that you need to do is walk the walk. Start with the intent of uh, learning about the field. It's, it's a plus anyway. So many students ask the question as to whether it's possible for them to hire someone to do the job for them, to do the statistical job for them, the quantitative part. For example, to, to enter the data for them and to uh, choose the appropriate statistical measure and provide them with ready-made conclusions. While it is recommended to seek help from a statistician, from an expert, after all, research is never done on an individual basis. It is not recommendable to write a thesis where there is a part by someone else. After all, in a thesis, it's just your name that appears there. That's one thing. If someone helps you, you need at least to know the logic behind each individual step. Why have you chosen, for example, this or that statistical measure? Have you, for example, satisfied the assumptions for this or that measure? What are the results that you have achieved and what do they mean? So all these questions need to be answered by the uh, researcher himself or herself, because on the day of the defense, there are the chances for a jury member to ask questions about a, a, a number that might seem to be a very futile number. So many students show blockage at this level. When asked further questions about the statistical part, they answer that they were helped by someone else. Okay, my friend, being helped by someone is one thing, and having someone do the job, the entire job for you, is quite another. Therefore, you have to pay attention. Uh, the students are kindly requested to pay attention to this. You know, there is some effort that needs to be uh, made by the researcher himself or herself, even if you get help from someone else. And with this in mind now, let's move on to the discussion of quantitative research designs. Different authors uh, provide different taxonomies for quantitative research designs, some more detailed than others. However, the overwhelming majority agree on four types. The descriptive, the correlational, the experimental and the quasi-experimental. We will try to explain each of these designs with adequate illustrative examples. The first quantitative design to start with is the descriptive statistical design. What is a descriptive design? A descriptive quantitative design is one that involves no manipulation of variables. For example, if the researcher would like to collect data on the student's preferences of the characteristics of a good teacher, he or she can construct a questionnaire with a repertoire of characteristics of a good teacher and he or she asks them to tick. These can be turned into numbers and can be explained. Generally, with descriptive designs, we resort to descriptive statistics like the mean, the median, the standard deviation. We can report, you know, results in the form of frequencies, percentages, uh, uh, cross tabs, etc. 
One misconception about uh, descriptive quantitative designs is that they are weak. The fact of the matter is that they are not weak as long as the choice of design is heavily dependent on our objectives and therefore on our hypotheses. This is with the understanding that descriptive quantitative designs can serve as preliminary for further studies. And now with the second type of quantitative research design, which is the correlational design. The correlational design is a design that seeks to establish relationships between two or more variables. For example, let's imagine a situation where we have two variables. If the researcher uh, adopting a correlational design finds out that as the first variable increases, the other one also increases, then this is evidence of a correlation between the two. And therefore, we can project the conclusion that the two variables are related. Sometimes the researcher finds out that one variable increases and the other one decreases. This is also evidence of a relation that exists between these two variables, except that this relation is negative. Negative because they do not go in the same direction. Where one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa. Here is a concrete example. Just imagine a group of students spending, for example, uh, long hours in the library. And we want to know whether the amount of time spent at the library corresponds to an increase in their grades. So what we can do is, okay, consider the variable in terms of hours spent uh, in the library and compare it with the grades, with the performance in the form of grades. So if we find out that as the number of hours spent in the library increases, the grades increase, then we have evidence that there is a relation between the two variables. And therefore we say that the two variables correlate positively. Some students intend to look for the impact of variable X on variable Y. And the, it, it is often said clearly in the objectives and also in the hypotheses, only to find out that all that the student does is run the correlation analysis to project conclusions about the impact. This is false. Why? Because the job of the statistical measures of correlation Pearson product moment correlation, Spearman row, and maybe others. The job of these statistical measures is only to say whether there is a relation or not and what direction this relation is taking. Is it negative? Is it positive? A correlational analysis is not meant for measuring impact. Spending long hours in the library correlating with an increase in grades does not imply that it is the library that causes the grades to go high. Bottom line, the correlational design says whether there is a relation and whether it's weak or strong and whether it's positive or negative and it stops there. Now we move to the third type of quantitative design, which is the experimental design. In an experimental design, the researcher has to manipulate the independent variable or variables of the study and has to control for others. For example, just imagine that a researcher hypothesizes that learning vocabulary in context gives better results than teaching it explicitly. So here the researcher can assign students to two groups. One group receives explicit instruction and the other one receives instruction through context. There will be a pretest, of course, to make sure that they have the same initial level. And after there will be a post-test to see if the two groups are any different after having been exposed to different instructional approaches. One of the challenges of the experimental design is the difficulty of manipulating the variables because there is always this risk of having the results being imputed to other extraneous variables. So the researcher should take time to lay the groundwork for this design and uh, create ideal conditions for the study to take place. The last design that we're going to talk about is the quasi-experimental. The difference between experimental and quasi-experimental resides in random assignment. The quasi-experimental relies on pre-existing groups, so it does not assign them, it, they are already there. So it's not a true experiment in the sense that the uh, groups are already assigned, they are assigned beforehand, they are naturally assigned, let's say. This is why these types of designs are also called ex post facto designs. They are ex post facto because ex post facto meaning after the fact. The quasi-experimental design does not have the means of controlling all the potential extraneous variables. Let's imagine, for example, that uh, the government has imposed a given language as being the language of instruction. And let's imagine that the researcher 
intends to evaluate this new policy and he or she uh, assigns a test before the implementation and a test after the implementation. The researcher in this case can select the schools, for example, or the areas in the country that have implemented the policy and those areas that have not, or those institutions that have not implemented it. Here, there is no random assignment and the elements or the students consulted are self-selected, self-assigned to uh, different groups. The study here is ex post facto because the selection has already been done. This is a good example of a quasi-experimental study. Thank you very much for watching the video and expect more on uh, quantitative data analysis. Thank you.